seminar of of the summer seminar of European Left. As you may know, every year the European Left Party organizes its uh, summer university around Europe in different cities of Europe. But of course, this year, due to the, these hard times of pandemic, the the summer the summer university turned into summer seminars that will take place online. And it's obviously a great thing to be all here together in order to share our experiences in, that we had during this year and a half of pandemic. Uh, the topic of this first summer seminar is uh, the post-pandemic world and the, the hopes in order to build a new world and a new society. Of course, we lived, uh, we experienced uh, one year and a half of pandemic, and this impacted a lot, um, obviously, also on the on the youth. And the youngsters are worried about their future because of the lack of certainties, precariousness, exploitation, the Great Recession. The new generations risk being poorer than their fathers. And the global context is marked by the constant, the constant risk of wars, by the devastating effects of climate change and by ever more widespread poverty. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic amplified the impact of the global crisis we are living. For this reason, today, we organized this first seminar of the summer seminar that will continue today in the afternoon and also tomorrow morning and tomorrow afternoon too. Um, I would also to uh, give the floor in this opening of this first seminar to Marga Ferrer from Ta for Transform Europe for his intervention. Please, Marga. Thank you, Vincenzo. Um, thank you all of the attendees uh, and the participants. My name is Marga Ferrer. I'm the co-chair of Transform Network. Transform is the uh, political foundation of the European Left Party, and it's a network of political foundations and Center of the Studies, and even trade union foundations too, uh, for 23 countries in Europe. We got 34 organizations all around the continent with people dedicated to think and to create political dialogue, dialogue and also research, studies, service, and uh, this analyzing and sharing knowledge that is absolutely needed, we think, in the, in the left today. So I encourage you, all of you, to go to our website, transfer slash network.net, so you can see there some dossiers, publications, analysis, and some ideas that maybe will help you with your political analysis or the debate you have with others. So let me make a short introduction with answering the question and you know, the hopes for this new post-pandemic uh, uh, times, you know, particularly for, for the young people. You know. Well, you see, in transfer network, in all of our debates or analysis we have, we see different challenges that we are facing now. But one of the most important is the huge changes that uh, in the capitalist system is uh, happening today. And we know uh, that the young perspective the youth perspective to this crisis is different to others because the young people have suffered from the first crisis 10 years ago, 2008, and now a second one with this pandemic. So the perspective is completely different from people who doesn't see it as a whole life crisis as most of you have suffered or two. You know? So we are absolutely interested in listening to all the young people, the language, the analysis, the perspective of the future is something essential. Why? Because we see in this, uh, these times how uh, not only the European Union, but also the Davos Forum, you know, the, the forum where all the economic neoliberals joined together, they launched the idea that the way for capitalism to get out of this crisis are two lines. No? The green capitalism in one side and the other, the digital capitalism, as they said, I'm using their words. We see now in the European Union this next generation proposal, all the recovery funds that the European Union are putting on the table, huge amount of money, you know, huge, uh, under the magical world of digitalization of our economy. You know? What does it mean? You know? We know that this means, particularly for young people, for part of the young people, precariousness. 
That means that the economy, the platform economies, no, is based on two um, ideas. No, the first one is the new market, the uh, job market, labor market created by the economy platform economies is divided. No, so if you have the skills, the education, and the capacity and the money to go to university and go to some skills you can be part of one labor market. If not, you are out of the, the majority of the population, millions of people we are talking now, that are outside these skills or education or knowledge. So uh, the precariousness there will be huge. And that means particularly for the more vulnerable parts of the, of the chain that are women, young people, young precarious people and migrant workers. These three uh, weakest part of the change, as they, well, we know that the way how capitalism are going to get out of this crisis on the shoulders of women, more precarious work for women, more precarious work for some parts of the youth class, uh, working class, and more precarious jobs for the migrant workers. So in our political theory, meaning we are all leftists, that means something important that I send it to you for the debate, no? which is in our political theory, the most vulnerable parts of the chains are called to be the political subject of the change too, meaning that there are people who have less chains to lose, as our classics used to say. So the outlook, the language, the analysis of women, youth, and migrants are absolutely essential to understand how capitalism are, in, are uh, improving, improving, sorry, using more uh, exploitation. And it's really essential because if do we don't have this outlook, this language, this analysis, we are absolutely lost in order to analyze the reality of the popular classes today. So it's something that uh, I give it to you, but I, I'm absolutely sure we are going to this in the in the near future. These uh, changes in, in the composition of the structural classes in Europe is like a huge gap between different parts of the working class and we need to link them in some way. This is a huge challenge for us. The second one, Clearly, is the climate change. I mean, uh, this pandemic, of course, besides the economic and uh, the social crisis, we know as leftists know the public services, the economic exploitation. Uh, we have this new challenge. No, it's not new, but it's something really urgent, urgent to deal with, which is the climate change. You know, we know that the system react with the offer of digital, uh, sorry, green capitalism or the new green deal, all of this, uh, you know, way of understanding that changing small things inside capitalism, it will be enough. We know that it's not true, not only we, there is million and million of young, very young people going to the streets last year, you know, for Friday for Future, all around the world, uh, reclaiming something very obvious, that is that the Capitalism is part of the problem. It cannot be part of the solution. Even if they don't name it as capitalism or neoliberalism, it is clear that the free market for the huge companies who are responsible for the 90% of the emissions uh, are not part of the solution. So we hope we, we, got, uh, uh, we will uh, be in Glasgow in November in the COP26 uh, Alter Summit, also as Transform and the European Left Party, and we hope that a lot of young people can go there also to have these debates about how to deal with the climate change with a completely different perspective, which is the, the commons, uh, to debate about the property, or to debate how can we change the production model and the consumption model. And my last question, and I finish with this, I do promise, is that I think one of the challenges that we have as leftists, and also we have, you have as young people, is how can we improve our organizations, meaning the political parties we, most of us, we belong to, have the same structure created 100 years ago, more or less. No? Is this enough for today? Is something need to be changed to be more open to um, talk directly with these migrant, young, precarious workers, these uh, women? No? Uh, how can we be more useful as political parties? And I think it's something that they all guard as me. We cannot answer easily. So I would prefer to listen to all of you and eager to listen to your ideas because I'm sure that is not only the future, but it's the present we need as leftists all around Europe. Thank you very much for listening to me. Please go to the Transform Network website. We also have a newsletter and I'm sure we can uh, contact us if you meet anything and I'm sure we can collaborate more in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marga. I'm sure that we will try to answer to your question also at the end of the of the round table.
Uh, well, so we thought of, we thought this seminar as a round table, as I said before. So we will have several interventions from all over Europe by members of youth organization that uh, will share with us experiences, activities, and also contribution on how the world is changing and how the way of doing activism changed in these times of pandemics. We will have speeches from Ireland, Italy, France, Greece, Finland, and also on behalf of the International People's Assembly. Uh, this is one of the first public occasion also for the European Left Youth Network to present itself. We have recent, recently reorganized our youth network, so I'm really happy to have uh, the opportunity to introduce the first seminar of the two organized by the, the European Left Youth Network. So um, I think we are on time to start and I uh, would like to give the floor to Leon Kiernan from Ogra Sinn Féin Youth Organization of the Irish Party Sinn Féin. Please, Liam. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. Um, so yeah, so my name is Liam Kiernan, I'm representative of uh, Ogre Sinn Féin, the youth wing of Sinn Féin here in Ireland. Um, so the past year and a half uh, has been absolutely transformative uh, for both our party and youth, uh, youth organization, yeah, like even without COVID. Um, about a month before COVID began, our party became the largest party uh, in the Dublin Parliament, uh, leading to a surge in membership and a new direction in, and energy for our movement. Uh, and then in the north of Ireland, the implementation of the Brexit deal has turned politics completely on its head I made it clear that Irish unity is well on its way. Uh, so the partition of Ireland has a massive effect on how the COVID crisis has been dealt with in Ireland. Uh, despite being one island, uh, we're separated into two jurisdictions with each having their own means and methods of addressing the COVID crisis. Uh, the far right DUP, who my party uh, is in a mandatory power sharing coalition with in the north, uh, has opposed common sense COVID restrictions from the beginning and is fervently against any sort of north-south coordination uh, or cooperation on this issue or any other issue. Uh, this basically made it impossible to pursue strategy and um, similar to that uh, done in Australia and New Zealand uh, where COVID was completely eradicated because as you may know Ireland is an island and there's sea all around it and we could control the borders but unfortunately that was not uh, possible due to the um, interventions of the DUP. Uh, and then in the south uh, the Dublin government has been completely ineffective at responding to the crisis uh, with the Republic of Ireland having arguably the uh, most uh, time spent in lockdown in all of Europe while still having above average case numbers and deaths while falling well behind in vaccine rollout. This is due to both the government's unwillingness to play, uh, uh, play scientific advice above economic interests and its inability to plan ahead and make good usage of lockdowns. Uh, and then furthermore, uh, the weakness of the health system in Ireland uh, had been made perfectly clear by this pandemic. Uh, the South has an outdated uh, and under-resourced system that is a hybrid of both private and public healthcare and has seen little improvement or investment in decades. Uh, a severe shortage in hospital beds has long been an issue before COVID uh, and now the pandemic has hit us, uh, we have far less capacity than is required with one of the lowest numbers of hospital beds per residence in Europe. Uh, the system in the north of Ireland, on the other hand, is part of the British NHS and is a fully public system. Um, however, it's been severely damaged by decades of Tory cuts and mismanagement. Its capacity is uh, far too low and the pandemic hospitals have uh, uh, often been completely overfull of patients. Uh, there are also times in which hospitals and clinics had to resort to using British Army assistance, which is a serious legacy issue for families who, have been, who may have lost loved ones in the decades of conflict on this island. Uh, so the need for radical change in healthcare is completely clear. And my organisation has long advocated for the establishment of an all-Ireland national healthcare system. Uh, with this issue seeing increased tension due to the ongoing pandemic, it's likely that we see real political momentum shifting towards healthcare reform in future years. And then another massive issue here in Ireland, particularly in Dublin, uh, which is where I live, um, is housing. Uh, average rents in Dublin, uh, Dublin have risen to the highest level of any city in the EU, while rents elsewhere in the country have been uh, rising rapidly. Housing is one of the most severe and wide-reaching issues in the country, with thousands left homeless and many more paying extortionate rents. This is particularly an issue for young people who are often priced out of moving out of their parents' homes and have nearly no opportunity to buy their own home. Uh, additionally, the housing crisis is a major obstacle for both higher education and job opportunities by pro prohibiting many working class young people from moving to cities for college or work. This has long been a crisis, but the pandemic has made it far more severe. Uh, the decline in people's incomes due to unemployment, um, even with the pandemic unemployment payment, and the stopping of construction all across the state, uh, the resumption of austerity policies by the government, uh, is all likely to make this crisis get worse before it gets better. 
uh, there is growing uh, political consciousness around housing and a growing pressure for change. Um, but however, it's still uh, an issue that um, is likely to exist for a long, long time. Uh, there are uh, uh, community organizations uh, such as CATU, uh, which is a community action tenants union uh, that have begun to emerge across the country uh, and are a means of renters fighting back against rising rents and exploitative landlords. Um, so the economic and social effects of this pandemic uh, have certainly hit young people the hardest in the country. Uh, young people have been uh, uh, the essential workers keeping shops open and working in hospitals from the beginning. Uh, we in Ireland have received next to no support from the government and are constantly blamed for rising case numbers, despite it being young people who abide by health restrictions the most. Vaccines are still unavailable for us and it's likely the government will uh, take a two-tiered approach to reopening from the pandemic. With restaurants open only to customers who are fully vaccinated, while those serving them and cooking for them are placed at risk due to their lack of vaccination. Uh, so in previous decades, uh, particularly here in Ireland, uh, young people's main outlet when faced with a government that didn't care about them and a country that offered them very little opportunity uh, was to emigrate. Uh, in this crisis, however, the whole world is experiencing li uh, largely the same thing. And uh, emigration is not easy, uh, the easy way out that it once was. Uh, people, particularly young people, uh, are angry and willing to take a stand at, at the many issues that face us. But unfortunately, due to the pandemic, it's been far more difficult to organize and mobilize people to take action. Uh, so for most of the pandemic, uh, my organization's main focus has to have been education, largely because there's little else we could do due to the restrictions. So we had a huge number of Zoom discussions on multitude of topics uh, with politicians and activists from all over Ireland and all over the world, uh, as well as other forms of uh, virtual engagement with politics. So education is very important to grow up our understanding of activism and of politics, both at home and abroad, uh, but it's no re a replacement for activism in our communities. Um, certainly Zoom meetings and social media is important for linking people from far away, given that we are in a Zoom meeting right now, um, and expanding the uh, uh, accessibility of information and spreading a political message. Uh, but online interaction cannot build the uh, camaraderie that is necessary for any activist group, and social media is no real alternative to real activism. And um, so speaking from personal experience, um, I think from the entire uh, entirety of the pandemic, it's been just very difficult to get people out on the street even afterwards if they've never met anyone if they don't know anyone for your organization if, if they've just seen faces on a zoom screen and then all of a sudden just messages in a whatsapp group chat uh, saying oh well we're trying to get people out for a, a leaflet drop um, uh, next week people are not willing to get out if they don't know anyone uh, it's almost uh, sort of the, like the social aspect has been deprived from politics basically for the whole pandemic um, and it's very important in the future that we uh, bring that back. We don't get stuck in uh, the idea that Zoom meetings are a replacement for in-person meetings, even though it is certainly convenient just to pop on your laptop um, and uh, go into your meeting. Um, and for us, certainly the inability to have demonstrations for the past year and a half has been very frustrating um, considering the you know, great number of issues uh, uh, that are very relevant for us. Um, and it's very important for uh, leftists and young people in particular um, to retain our energy and anger to con uh, confront these issues head on. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Really interesting. This was one of the points we wanted to have in our discussion, how our activism changed. And now I proceed with the introduction of the next intervention which is a recorded, recorded intervention by Marco Marrone, uh, who is a comrade close to the young communists in Italy, but he's also a researcher at the University of Venice and a member of Riders Union, one of the organization in Italy that fights for the improvement of working and living condition of the riders. As Marga anticipated in her introductory speech, one of the hottest political topics during the, the pandemic concerned the, the workers of the gig economy, platform economy, in particular the riders, and the centrality assumed by their work and also the poor conditions in terms of social rights and salary. Uh, in Italy, the riders had to wage uh, a hard fight to have their rights recognized and obtain also a decent salary. And most of all, they are uh, really young. 
So I asked to the European left staff to transmit the intervention of Marco Marrone, who will better illustrate the state of the art of the riders' fight. Hi, everyone, and thank you very much to the European left for having invited me in this meeting and for also for the struggles they keep. Uh, I am Marco Marrone. I'm a researcher currently in the University of Venice of Kavoskari. And my interests regard the digital labor and platform capitalism. I have recently published a book named Rights Against the Machine, where uh, I tell about the experiences of Riders Union in Bologna, an informal union of food delivery workers, which has been struggling since 2017 to get the rights for this work and also for other kinds of work. And, my research, I, I've had the uh, fortune also to be to be one of the activists of this uh, of, of this group. Uh, this year, and an half has been uh, very intense and difficult. Uh, uh, as many say, the pandemic has revealed the fragilities of our society, highlighting the unsustainability of our system. However, the pandemic has not impacted on everyone at the same way. And the outback of the virus, the entrance in our lives, has in fact made us experience a new layer of inequality, which maybe can be an indicator of the impact that climate change and environmental issues will have on the future of work. On one hand, we have seen those who had the possibility to work from home, repaired from the virus and from the, uh, reducing the risk of contagious. On the other, we have seen those workers who have been forced to challenge the virus, working in an external environment which is increasingly becoming difficult and which is still populated by the virus. A division that, however, has not been a result of technical issues, but is also a result of power asymmetries. In many cases, those working outside are also those with poorer wages and with a lack of union power. So it is not a case that in the first lockdown, workers of the logistics sector have represented 1% of the COVID injuries reported in Italy, but 10% of the workers who died for the virus. Now, how can we explain this data? On one hand, we may think that the virus is particularly effective on these workers and on those working in the logistics sector, but on the other hand, we may realize that this is an effect of a lack of worker power, which has forced them, uh, which has forced workers in this sector to keep working despite having themselves and their beloved, their families in danger and in the risk of being contagious. However, if we already knew that workers in companies like Amazon or in platforms like in the food delivery were deprived of labor rights, we definitely have been surprised by the fact that the services were not even existing five years ago have now been recognized as essential. A recognition that if on one hand have given to this platform the, pos the possibility to massively increase the profits during the emergency, on the other has given very little benefits to workers who still remained in lack of the main labor and uh, main labor and uh, the main labor rights. Thus, not only for delivery workers, since they are mostly still recognized as independent contractors, have not had access to the individual protection devices, but they have also been excluded by all kinds of benefits, both those provided to full employees and also in many cases those provided for self-employed since, uh, since in many cases the poor wages of food delivery platforms do not allow them to get a regular VAT position. Not only, the essential status of platform has also been an opportunity to wash their images, making appear private platform multinational corporation as those saving the humanity and those giving us the possibility to avoid the risk of the virus. A proper operation which has revealed the whole project of platform capitalism, not simply that of getting the hegemony of the market, not simply that of being some of the most, the richest companies in the global economic scenario, but they want to be the market itself. In this sense, 
digital platform represent a uh, crucial uh, breakthrough from the past. They are not simply company like uh, we have experienced in the past, but they are now becoming an infrastructure around which the whole economy and society is restructuring. We have used platforms not only to get restaurant food or to buy things on Amazon during the health emergency, but also for education or to speak with our friends. In this sense, I was surprised by how much it seemed natural to move activities as such education, who is supposed to be a human and a constitutional right, on digital platform, without thinking, without criticizing the fact that we are feeding them with data, which is actually the real oil, the, the, the real resource that boosts their expansion. Let me explain this point. We may say that platforms have a double source of value. On one hand, exploiting labor, which despite the digitalization, despite the technological innovation, despite what economists have often foreseen, is far from being so, uh, work is far from being substitute for machine. More than uh, more than uh, more than having machines doing work, actually technological exploitation is explo uh, it's, uh, increasing the mass of exploitation of labor exploitation. But this is not the only source of value. The other source of value is that of collecting data, which, in order to be valuable, needs to be constantly provided by the spontaneous but always driven interaction of users. Platform extract data, process them, and use them. They may be used to improve their services or, more frequently, to sell them to the best offers, as the case of Cambridge Analytics says. In this sense, despite the many limits that the book of uh, surveillance capitalism from Soshana Zubov say, it gets a crucial point. Surveillance is not anymore positioned at the border of production, it's not anymore a way in which the proletarian are educated and uh, you know, forced to work, but it is now at the center. Uh, every act, every action that works and that we also do interacting with platform produces data, and this is the real oil speeding this, uh, this, uh, the, the expansion of this form of capitalism. This means that even now that we are discussing through our platforms, we are actually feeding the capitalist machine. But also, on the other hand, we do not really have an, an alternative. And this is the real meaning of platform becoming infrastructure. The more we use them, the more we become dependent. They are not simply object, but they are they are, the, they are an infrastructure where object lies, and this is giving them the possibility to penetrate at the heart of society and to reconfigure the whole social relationship around the new digital infrastructure. So digitalization is not a literal translation, it's not just moving one thing from the other, but it is actually a process of accumulation which is allowing capitalism to expand their borders even outside of what we proper consider as work. But, not, but the pandemic has also revealed that we are not disarmed. The No Delivery Day is organized by the Italian network of food delivery unions, Rider per i Diritti, in the 26th of May. But also the Amazon full supply chain happened one week before, and the strike that we have seen happening in through all Amazon warehouses since the beginning of the pandemic says that the expansion of platform can be challenged. A few years ago, these workers were considered unorganizable. They are now not only the, new prota the protagonists of a new wave of unionization, but by challenging their subalternity, they are also experimenting in new alliances and forms of struggles which can and should be replicated. Firstly, avoiding the power asymmetry in the workplace by calling society and institution in action. A strategy that in Bologna we have experienced for uh, the Bill of Rights of digital workers in the urban sector, but that in the country has also allowed food delivery workers to move and to push the parliament to regulate this sector. A recognition and an important achievement that uh, has been crucial also in getting the fundamental result of, of the agreement that we recently signed with, that recently signed with Takeaway.com which is uh, actually the first agreement recognizing food delivery workers as full employee. This means giving them 
the possibility to, to get what food delivery workers have always asked, which is the same rights of other kinds of workers, despite the fact that they work through and are intermediated by digital platforms. Secondly, by developing new forms of alliances, such as those between workers and consumers, but also those with the, with those with the people living in the city, which is not only the ground where the platform articulates their accumulation dynamics and expands their margin of exploitation, but it's also, but it's also the battlefield where informal unions have found the necessary resources to organize and to revolt the digital technologies against themselves. An alliance which now needs to go beyond the, the image that we usually have of digital workers, which which usually is that of a white collar sitting in their office or something like this. But we need to include the new digital capitalism, also the logistic workers, also those extracting the, the blood materials in Africa, which is necessary to build our smartphones, or those who need to dispose the goods we consume, those producing the necessary energy to feed our clouds, or even those uploading content on social networks. If platform capitalism is expanding the margins of exploitation, we need to expand the margin of organizing and unionization too. But we also need politics. If platforms have so rapidly expanded, it's not simply because of technological innovation, but also thanks to the desert produced by 30 years of neoliberalism. In this sense, platforms can be understood as the way in which capitalism has managed to restructure and to avoid the blocks of 2008 crisis, benefiting from the impact that austerity policies have had on the society, which have resulted in a huge demand of these uh, forms of gig employment. They now they know how to use politics, and they also know, and they also have showed us how to do it in the case of Prop 22 in California where platforms, where a coalition of platforms actually, have invested billions of dollars to move people to vote against the pro-labor the pro law, pro laws, which have been described as possible killers of the magnificence of the de development of the Silicon Valley. But as far as we know, they are now doing the same in the Euro European Parliament where the proposal of recognizing digital workers as employees, which has been recently moved by the GUA, the European left, the, and the Socialist Party, among the others, uh, now we know that it's being challenged by a coalition of platforms lobbying the Macron group and the liberals using the same arguments that we have seen working in California. This means that the results that uh, Food delivery workers and other digital workers have been gained in years of struggles. Only think that in the city of Bologna we have had more than 50 strikers in just three years. Can be cancelled by the lobbying activities the platforms are conducting at European level. This is why we need to respond by learning from digital workers' struggles, which means by getting the ability of coalizing among different among different workers, but also among different political views in order to respond to this assault and to all those that are being moved against the working class by conservative and liberal governments. I think that uh, in the aftermath of the pandemic, we have learned something. We have learned that no one can save himself, no one can be saved alone. And it is only together that we can make the new normality better than what we have experienced. And this is not only for us, but for everyone. Okay, well, this was the intervention of Marco Marrone. And so I would uh, remind to all, uh, all the ones who are uh, watching this seminar that they can also write their uh, question in the, in the Zoom chat uh, for the question and answers uh, moment that will follow at the end of the round table among this. And then I would like to give the floor to Yiri Mantisalo from the Communist Institute of Finland. Please, Yiri. Thank you, Vincenzo, and thank you for this opportunity to speak today in this 
European Left and Transform Europe's summer seminar. I see it very uh, positive that though we are still in this global pandemic and do not have very much possibilities to see and meet physically, so we can use these digital platforms and keep on debating and focusing on important questions, European-wide and internationally. As it is said in this uh, event's description, that COVID-19 pandemic has shaken the world. And we have seen that just like in any political issue, there is uh, plenty of ways how to respond or not to respond to this crisis. And the way to respond to corona crisis is also a political question. For many figures and politicians have said that this corona crisis should not be politicized. But I have grown with uh, the large idea of politics that everything you do, every chance you take, does have impacts on other things. And it has political meaning. So I would say that even, even corona crisis and its treatment is a question of politics. Impacts of this COVID-19 pandemic are visible for a long time ahead, and the uh, length depends how each country and administration has treated pandemic. If there's an administration that was in the very beginning of COVID-19 uh, ready to take bold steps to stop virus and its spreading and administration that has done the required uh, decisions for the health of people. So most prob probably these countries and regions will survive better on other impacts of pandemic, social and economical uh, impacts too. This question of providing, uh, yes, sorry, this question of providing tools for activism in the post pandemic world is essential. Civil society as a whole, in large scale, does have impact on crisis, and the crisis does have impact to civil society. Many administrations and governments have cared about the companies and private business and how they are doing uh, during this pandemic. But many civil societies and non-profit organizations have been forced, forced to face the reality of uh, new conditions because of COVID-19. And my question is that how many administration, administrations have been really interested how it's going in on the field of organization and uh, civil society. And even better question is that what has been done for the field of organizations and civil society. Mm, I am the chairperson of Communist Youth of Finland, which is the youth organization of Communist Party of Finland. And I can say a few words how the Finnish government, led by Social Democrats and Prime Minister Sanna Marin, has treated Finnish youth field uh, during this corona crisis. Uh, I would like to start uh, saying that in Finland we have a totally different way to finance uh, youth field by public funds. Uh, that other sectors of society don't have. Youth organizations are supported with the profits of Finnish gaming company called Veikkaus. Uh, and uh, as you can guess, so the profits of this gaming company have been lowered because of COVID-19. The, the game halls and the gaming machines have been closed to this uh, virus. And of course, the youth field has been worried that these lower profits of Veikkaus mean cuts to the support of organizations too. For the long time before coronavirus, corona crisis, uh, Finnish youth field has campaigned 
and demand that this unwanted tie between gaming company and youth field must end and public funding for organizations must be provided from the general budget of state. Uh, because first of all, there is no logical reason why youth fields funding have to come from the profits of gaming company. And secondly, we see the real moral problem in this system. When the people play games and lose money, so that money will go to the youth organizations, among others. Especially when we have over 100,000 people in Finland facing the gaming problems that will cause many other problems to their everyday life. So this, this is the real contradiction. Uh, but for now, when this funding system is what it is, so, so we were worried in the youth field about the cuts that were possible. We protested against those cuts. Uh, in April this year, the government decided to compensate the lower ed gaming company profits, but in total, the youth field faced uh, cuts of 5 million euros. The cut was not so big what we expected, but it's still a lot of money, 5 uh, million euros. And that money is all gone from the actions of the youth field. When we look the uh, governments and institutions actions, so, so I cannot say that the civil society in general has got much help during this crisis. But of course, the whole action field has changed for civil society. Few things are like they used to be and much has happened. And nearly all campaigning and work has moved to online until it's possible to meet people uh, again on the streets. I think it's reasonable to see also some good impacts of this pandemic. And I think that this kind of situations when uh, several things are not like they used to be, uh, it's a brand new opportunity to rethink own work and working methods to uh, what, can I, what can I do to improve them to eat even better. When we look the forms of activism, uh, there has been taken huge steps forward uh, when it comes to the uh, digital plat platforms, social media and online cam campaigning. Uh, we in Communist Youth of Finland were also in front of new times when it became clear that it's not possible to organize physical events. We had to take a pause uh, from it for a while. But nearly right after that, one comrade proposed that uh, what if we start org organizing stream podcast, uh, broadcast uh, on political themes on Facebook. And that was the uh, starting point on our journey to use digital platforms for political work. First, we didn't have very much knowledge about streaming and virtual events, but with this concrete work and learning more and more, we managed to organize several virtual events, mostly on Zoom uh, and Facebook Live, that gathered in total likely more people to listen and participate uh, than it would be possible physically. In the beginning of New Age, when we were uh, when we held our first virtual events, there was surprisingly many people online. After like one and a half year of these digital times, it's much more difficult to activate people to attend uh, events online and debates uh, if if there are chance for it. I see it like that. Uh, some of us have become tired with all online meetings and webinars, so it might feel that there's no much more to give. I understand that kind of feeling very well, 
and we have to find uh, a balance for our activism and attendings to feel better. I'm very, very much waiting um, the golden time, or should I say the red time of uh, hybrid uh, events, that there is possibility to attend physically and also online. Uh, Thor, we might feel ourselves tired at uh, some point. I think strongly that every leftist worker, activist, politician, experts should admit that uh, the, the role of digital platforms, social media and online campaigning has the real parts of the political work. And I want to encourage every leftist to get into and start using social media uh, if you still haven't done it. Uh, we have to always remember that everyone sh uh, uh, should find and take their own place in politics and activism. But on social media, the focus is uh, what the masses do. And that's why we need to be there with masses. And just like it is with uh, physical political work, when everyone does something little, so together as a collective, we make results. And when everyone does, uh, does even a little on social media, so we gain more and more audience to our message and empower oppressed people and people in solidarity to join our struggles. It is also true that every oppressed comrade is not on social media, so we will always need physical political work too. And whenever it's possible, do this health situation. So we have to be there on the street, meeting people and giving them alternatives and uh, views on changing uh, this world, changing this system. But it, important is to think that physical and digital political work will not uh, close each other out. Both are needed and both uh, need always new comrades. Uh, and as I, as I see that my time is running out, so I, I try to be uh, as short as I can. Uh, I mentioned the empowering earlier. Personally, I think that this word empowering has some many important meanings when it comes to the future of politics, uh, leftist politics and activism. This corona crisis has deepened uh, injustice, uh, invisibility and political apathy. Many workers do not see reasons to be interested about politics or even show solidarity when there is need to it. Of course, this is the reason of long term negative progress that has started in many countries like in Finland uh, from neoliberal right wing uh economic economical and social politics to market drive and way to implement politics but now i have started to feel that it's not enough that left, leftist parties and candidates are visible during election campaignings that working people does not care although they have choices to protect their own rights uh, that's why we need empowering. We have to save working people, our comrades, from this political apathy. And with this mission, it is a big help if we have concrete political programs and upcoming events where to invite people and, and they can find their own places in this struggle. That's why all, all physical and digital ways to uh, campaign will be needed. And uh, it's not just empowering others who, who belong to the working class. We need to empower ourselves to and in, in, uh, inspire uh, ourselves to learn and search more. Learning has always been the key way to drive this movement forward. So let's empower comrades uh, to organize versatile political actions. And le let's empower comrades to join social media and at least like pages and posts, share content and message about 
in whose troops are you standing? Uh, I thank you for this uh, opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you very much, Hiri, for your intervention. And then um, now I would like to give the floor to Leo Michel from the Communist Students Union of France. Leo. Bien, merci. Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Euh, alors, peut-être quelques mots pour commencer, euh, pour remercier l'organisation euh, du séminaire, euh, qui sont des séminaires toujours utiles et enrichissants, bien que cette année, ça ne se tienne pas en présentiel. J'espère qu'il que, qu nous sera utile pour, pour dégager des dynamiques communes d'action et de réflexion sur les enjeux qui, qui aujourd'hui structurent nos vies et qui, euh, qui structurent également nos, nos adresses politiques et plus particulièrement en direction de, de la jeunesse. En tout cas, voilà, merci de m'avoir permis d'intervenir aujourd'hui. Euh, merci à Vincenzo qui se charge de l'animation de ce séminaire également. Donc, euh, on l'a dit un petit, un petit peu avant que la conférence commence, mais euh, voilà, enfin, c'est une conférence qui est très euh, masculine, et cela se... aussi l'importance de, de développer et d'assurer des politiques de cadre féministes dans nos organisations. Euh, voilà, les responsabilités internationales, elles ont souvent été occupées par, par des hommes euh, dans nos organisations. Et j'espère que euh, l'année prochaine, vous pourrez rencontrer euh, des camarades femmes euh, qui occuperont ces responsabilités-là. Donc, à l'UEC, c'est ce qu'on essaye de faire. D'ailleurs, euh, chez les étudiants communistes, c'est ce qu'on essaye de faire, puisque notre direction nationale est composée à deux tiers de, de femmes et que dans le, la coordination nationale, nous ne sommes que deux hommes euh, sur huit. Donc, euh, je suis... Euh, représentatif de ce qui perdure dans la division du travail militant, mais à la fois peu représentatif de la sociologie de notre organisation. Euh, donc voilà, au-delà des, des pratiques, de nos pratiques militantes et organisationnelles, la pandémie, la pandémie est venue bousculer nos, nos réflexions sur les conceptions de l'engagement dans la jeunesse et euh, les quelques mobilisations qui se sont tenues cette année sont venus nous montrer que la, formula la formulation organisationnelle que nous proposons était sûrement à, à repenser. Donc, deux questions doivent nous occuper pour comprendre ce que nous pouvons apporter dans le mouvement social. La première est de déterminer de quelle frange des forces de transformation sociale nous devons être le porte-voix. Et la seconde est de savoir ce qui nous manque pour y parvenir. Voilà, notre génération, on l'a vu, elle est tiraillée entre le besoin profond de faire de la politique, d'une part, et le rejet de l'idée qu'elle s'en fait, d'autre part. Et parmi elles, euh, les franges les plus mobilisables, et de fait celles qui sont le plus mobilisées dans le tissu associatif, par exemple, ce sont les étudiants au sens large, donc y compris les lycéens, euh, et notamment celles et ceux de, de banlieues et de quartiers populaires. Et aujourd'hui, c'est ce qui manque principalement, en tout cas dans notre organisation, euh, ce qui manque principalement pour, pour notre organisation, c'est euh, de pouvoir s'adresser à LEE et d'avoir un lien organique avec le réseau associatif euh, para-étudiants euh, voilà, qui permettent de faire basculer cet engagement en, en un engagement euh, politique assumé et euh, collectivement organisé. Euh, plus largement, nos dernières expériences autour de, de campagnes en ligne nous ont appris aussi que nous devons pousser plus loin la, la dématérialisation et la fluidification de nos, de, de nos outils organisationnels. Euh, voilà, donc entre la menace de, de régime autoritaire et l'accélération du processus de numérisation qui est lié au, au Covid, il faut qu'on pense de toute urgence à, à passer un cap dans cette direction-là. Euh, voilà, ainsi, au-delà au de nous ouvrir au réseau associatif de, de jeunesse, il est crucial que nous parvenions à, à repenser grâce à cette dématérialisation, et c'est ce que disait Yeri, euh, notre manière de nous organiser afin de, de pouvoir consacrer toute, toute notre énergie dans le travail politique concret et euh, l'organisation concrète des jeunes que nous touchons. Donc, une condition indispensable pour aller dans ce sens, c'est de faire évoluer notre conception de la responsabilité politique, qui est aujourd'hui encore euh, parfois trop euh, gangrénée par une, une partie des pratiques militantes héritées de nos prédécesseurs. Euh, en un mot, euh, je veux dire que être responsable politique dans une, dans une organisation qui plus est communiste, euh, ce n'est pas gérer une, une bande de, de copains au service d'une bureau, bureaucratie, 
mais aussi être un, un animateur ou une animatrice identifiée du mouvement, du mouvement social dans sa fac, son réseau associatif, en s'appuyant sur nos outils politiques et organisationnels. Donc, après vos interventions qui étaient très intéressantes sur les travailleurs uberisés, l'engagement, enfin les nouvelles formes d'engagement militant en ligne, donc, qui sont des, des constats qu'à qu l'UEC et que moi-même partageons. Je souhaiterais revenir sur le, le titre de la conférence, Hopes for a Post-Pandemic World, qui est fondamentalement lié à la question climatique. Euh, nous savons que la, la crise sanitaire et la crise écologique sont profondément liées euh, entre elles et euh, que le réchauffement climatique, climatique entraînera par la fonte des glaces la libération de, de virus anciens qui pourraient à leur tour avoir des conséquences catastrophiques sur nos vies, Donc, à l'image de ce qui s'est passé euh, depuis que nous connaissons le, le Covid-19. Euh, voilà, la, la planète voit incontestablement son état se détériorer, euh, les différents systèmes naturels euh, interconnectés que sont la biosphère, l'atmosphère, l'hydrosphère, la lithosphère, se sont dégradés de, de manière profonde et euh, se sont dégradés euh, à travers, enfin, du fait des, euh, des activités humaines, avec ce que certains chercheurs ont nommé une grande accélération, un terme qui a été forgé dans les années 50. Donc voilà, l'urgence euh, de partager le constat sur l'état de la planète et d'élaborer des, des réponses à la hauteur des, des enjeux euh, se fait de, chaque jour de plus en plus pressant. Donc les, les derniers mouvements tels que euh, MeToo, Youth for Climate ou euh, Black Lives Matter témoignent euh, que l'exigence de faire grandir l'engagement internationaliste des étudiants et des jeunes est de première importance pour faire gagner les luttes émancipatrices à l'échelle de l'humanité. En effet, la, la France n'est pas la seule à expérimenter la synthèse du capitalisme et de l'autoritarisme réactionnaire, qui est encouragée de fait par euh, la bourgeoisie à travers le monde. On a eu l'exemple de Trump, on a encore Bolsonaro au Brésil, Orban, ce qui s'est passé en Autriche à un moment, mais aussi en Pologne actuellement. Donc, du fait de la redistribution des, des soutiens bourgeois au bénéfice euh, du camp de la réaction, nous nous retrouvons dans une période confusionniste extrêmement alarmante. Et ce processus-là, il n'est pas déconnecté euh, des questions écologiques. Au contraire, il se réalise souvent au détriment euh, des droits environnementaux et des droits fondamentaux. Et ce, malgré l'urgence euh, du bon vers la transformation sociale dont nos sociétés ont besoin pour... Euh, répondre aux enjeux du XXIe siècle. Et voilà, donc ces enjeux internationalistes sont également, des, bien sûr, des, des enjeux propres à chaque pays. En France, euh, la crise migratoire à prévoir en, en raison du changement climatique est aussi une des batailles idéologiques à mener pour vaincre l'extrême droite. Ainsi, la, la riposte écologiste devient, dans un, même, dans un même mouvement historique, une lutte contre l'extrême droite mais aussi une lutte pour la démocratie et le progrès social. Donc, euh, on pourrait dire que, je, sais, je vais le dire en anglais, mais « if red is the new green, green is also the new red euh, ». Donc, aujourd'hui, la, la convergence permise par la globalisation tend à créer des conditions de vie, des modalités de répression, des schémas de maintien de l'ordre et de contrôle qui sont similaires euh, ou qui tendent à être similaires partout dans le monde. Et cette convergence, elle inclut bien sûr la, la question des universités, la manière dont le savoir est partagé, diffusé, ainsi que les modes de coopération scientifique et académique. Donc pour répondre à ces défis scientifiques et politiques, l'université, comme actrice de la production et du partage du savoir, a un rôle déterminant à jouer. C'est un lieu incontournable pour documenter les transformations de la planète, contribuer à forger des solutions audacieuses et former les étudiants qui façonneront nos sociétés de demain. Donc, face à ces constats, les universités doivent particulièrement progresser sur le volet de la formation. Et une récente analyse montrait que l'enseignement supérieur français, mais également, je pense qu'au niveau européen, ça se vaut, l'enseignement supérieur ne prend pas suffisamment au sérieux les enjeux du réchauffement climatique et de la perte de biodiversité. Parallèlement à cela, les attentes et les demandes des étudiants en ce sens vont croissant, euh, ceux-ci et celles-ci s'estimant à juste titre insuffisamment formés aux enjeux écologiques qui, qui dessinent le monde. 
Donc voilà, le constat d'une jeunesse majoritairement acquise à la cause climatique doit nous faire envisager la question de l'action internationaliste et de la coopération, je pense. Donc euh, voilà, après, après vous avoir présenté rapidement ce sujet de l'écologie qui, qui nous tient à cœur, je souhaite euh, peut-être mettre sur la table quelques perspectives politiques pour nos organisations, nos associations, nos syndicats euh, et nos mouvements sociaux dans lesquels nous sommes impliqués. Je pense qu'une une perspective réjouissante et désirable pour les, les camarades de nos organisations et plus largement pour, pour la jeunesse impliquée dans, le, dans les mouvements sociaux serait de se mobiliser dans une campagne internationale pour le, le climat et donc de, de porter une conception large de la lutte écologique contre le réchauffement climatique et bien sûr en lien inconditionnel avec les, les luttes pour l'émancipation humaine. Mais nous devons être aussi en, en mesure de décliner des, des propositions précises que peut-être nous aurons la chance de discuter à un, à un autre moment. Euh, je pense par exemple à décarboner l'économie et les transports, transformer l'agriculture, gérer l'eau démocratiquement, ouvrir l'Europe aux migrations et euh, bien sûr, adapter les formations à la révolution écologique. Et euh, pour ce, euh, une bonne idée, ou une idée que je mets sur la table encore une fois, c'est serait de mettre en place une plateforme qui aurait pour objectif de s'articuler à un niveau européen et international et qui inscrirait euh, certaines pratiques à son mode de, de fonctionnement. Euh, je pense par exemple à une veille médiatique renforcée, des pratiques d'échange, de séminaires communs, comme, comme euh, ce qu'on est en train de faire, voilà, de, de rencontres internationales. Et voilà, j'espère que... que euh, la matérialisation de nos rencontres pourra se faire et que le retour officiel de, du uh, Europe, European Left Youth Network permettra d'engager de, un processus de ce type. Voilà, je, je pense aussi que nous serions ravis de, de développer un travail théorique plus régulier avec euh, Transform, qui produit bien sûr des, des réflexions et des analyses bien souvent enrichissantes euh, au niveau théorique et politique. En tout cas, merci encore et euh, voilà, j'en je, finis euh, maintenant. J'espère que je n'ai pas été trop rapide. Thank you very much, Leo. And so now I would like to give the floor to Maurizio from the International People Assembly. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm Maurizio Coppola from the International People's Assembly. Uh, an organization, a network bringing together mass movements and progressive organizations all over the world. And uh, my intervention uh, will focus on the question of the people's vaccine and also on the campaign, No Profit on Pandemic, that is demanding exactly that, uh, people's vaccine. I will try to give some political and theoretical elements, categories to understand all this question. So as Tricontinental, an IPA-linked research institute, points out, we live in a time of three apartheids. These apartheids include that of food, money, and medicine. At the heart of the medical apartheid is vaccine nationalism, vaccine hoarding, and vaccine apartheid. The COVAX Vaccine Alliance has seen vaccines move out of its reach first because of bilateral deals being made between the richer countries and the vaccine makers, and second, because of the lack of financial support from the richer states to the poorer ones. Those trends produce the fact that many countries will not see significant numbers of their population vaccinated before 2023. The cause of these three apartheids is the control that a handful of companies exercise over the global economy, driven by five types of monopolies, as economist and political activist Samir Amin laid out. The monopoly over science and technology, the monopoly over financial systems, the monopoly over access to resources, the monopoly over weaponry, and the monopoly over communications. Central to the discussion about vaccine apartheid are at least two of these monopolies, the monopoly over finance and the monopoly over science and technology. 
a lack of finances in hand draws many of the world states to international institutions as the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, for example. These financiers take their lead from the IMF, which has demanded that countries cut back on several crucial areas of human life, education and health care, for instance. Cutting funds for education drains countries' potential to develop sufficient numbers of scienti scientists as well as the scientific temper necessary to create essential technologies such as vaccine candidates. Intellectual group, the transfer of technology leaves countries disarmed for able to appropriate a lack of funds the well-being of their populations you hear me you have me yes now we can hear you okay sorry uh, a lack of funds has driven many states to surrender the possibility that they could advance the well-being of their populations as of april 2020 64 countries spent more to service their debt than on health care. We think it is not enough to demand the transfer of technology to states in the midst of a pandemic so that they can make the vaccine. As Vijay Prashad from Tricontinental Institute uh, says, technology is yesterday's science, science is tomorrow's technology. To use the social wealth, this is why Cuba has, against all odds, developed five different vaccines. Abdallah, the last one, and Cuba's four other vaccines stand as a shield against COVID-19. These vaccines emerge out of the social productivity. And this is exactly also the reason why we demand everyone, every social force, every political power to support the international campaign No Profit on Pandemic that uh, uh, we ask to support it by signing uh, the, the, the petition the, to reach one million signature, but also to build up local action groups defending the public health care system that includes also the abolishment of uh, patent on, uh, on vaccines and uh, the higher financing of, uh, of, of um, public health care systems. And above all, also to coordinate internationally to enforce people's power against private profit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maurizio. And now we can move to our last intervention from Aris, who is a member of the Youth of Syriza. Please, Aris, take the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm uh, really happy to be here. It's, uh, it's actually my first uh, seminar that I participate in of the uh, European Left and Transform Europe. So it's really, it's, it's, it's a good occasion in this, uh, in this year and a half of chaos that we've been in. And uh, let's, let me just jump uh, straight to my, uh, to my intervention then. Uh, it's been as uh, everyone has said that this an extremely difficult year and a half since the pandemic started. A pandemic which uh, fueled by the unwarranted expansion of the global market system managed to infiltrate every single aspect of our lives. Uh, personally, as a student, I felt this, uh, this crisis impacts uh, to, my, to my very core. But yeah, let's not get carried away here. Uh, the crisis in Greece and most of Europe had started long before uh, COVID came. From decades of uh, elitist neoliberal governments bringing their people uh, to their knees with policies of austerity to companies and their lobbyists burning our planet's resources to a crisp. The pandemic merely uh, acted as a catalyst, uh, showing all the weaknesses of this unjust system. 
a system uh, that during the uh, system and the crisis, the pandemic that during uh, that affected the, the student and working class communities of Greece to an unspoken of degree. Uh, from uh, 2019, from the summer of 2019, in fact, because as I said, this whole crisis is simply uh, has, had already started when uh, the neoliberals uh, took power in Greece. Uh, uh, they implemented a law uh, in that uh, banishes the asylum that once protected uh, university students and ideas uh, shared in them. Essentially, a cycle of oppression from then began. Uh, laws were passed that created a police force in universities, bringing uh, uh, from before it's actually implemented, causing a lot of uh, uh, police officers to storm into universities and arrest and even torture students that were simply practicing their political freedoms, their syndicalist freedoms. Uh, a continuous decline in funding and tenures and the law that, te te that uh, takes entry grades so high that almost 25,000 people won't be able to attend a university. Uh, combine that with uh, uh, that, uh, that oppression in education with uh, the economic oppression uh, where the government has now banished the eight-hour workday uh, and essentially will, uh, is going to have people working up to 12 hours and getting paid uh, the same. And you see that this, at least to us uh, and everyone here, is clearly uh, wrong. But where is... Uh, so what do we do the day after? That's, that's what matters. And what have we done uh, so far? How have we... Uh, how have we responded to this in the form of, uh, of activism? First of all, we since the very start of the pandemic in the uh, in the youth of Syria, we kept a very high online profile because it became clear that we couldn't be as uh, active physically. We organized uh, uh, info uh, informative events, uh, discussions, movie showings, everything. To, uh, to essentially get people interested, because people are uh, interested and people need, after experiencing uh, this sort of oppression, they feel the need to do something. So even here, even, even in a situation that has them unable uh, to be members of a collective, keeps them isolated, we saw people uh, not only coming, but also interacting and and that also translated in the streets when when it came when the moments came to demonstrate and we had to go to go out and about. So I think the fact that in uh, in this crisis we've managed and that's what I hear uh, from all of you from uh, from Ireland to to Finland we've managed to keep people active. That's a fair sign of hope, and we need to keep uh, to keep doing that because I'll and here I may I might. Um, slightly uh, disagree with uh, what um, uh, what was uh, with what uh, uh, I don't remember uh, I my the name is uh, not coming to me now with the position that the digital infrastructure is also causing us uh, to be dependent on the system I think in fact we've managed to use, this infrastructure to address the inequalities, the inadequacies of the system. So I think that uh, th there should be a balance. It's not something, it's not a law, it's not, uh, it's not written in the stars that uh, this infrastructure will go against us. It's, it's about how you use it. It's about how we, how we mold it to our needs. Now in universities, going back to, to my community, because this is my experience. <laughs> uh, we, need, uh, we need not only an increase in funding and tenures to allow younger people in, teach, in teaching positions to, to, to have a more intersectional uh, knowledge, but also 
to revise uh, certain aspects of different curricula to uh, to make them address not the problems of the day, but the questions of tomorrow, how we can be useful uh, to, uh, to, to the needs of, of our society, because that's, that's, I think, the purpose of education, not only to make us critical, uh, critical thinkers, but to also make us useful members of a collective body that can, after having uh, seen how uh, to be useful, and after having, you know, this around around this all around experience, uh, address and fight as a collective, not as individuals, because this is the only way uh, we'll manage to to sort of come on top of this situation. Because there's going to be more and more crisis coming. And the and uh, everyone everyone has said so from uh, the WHO warning that there will be more pandemic that there's going to be a sort of a pandemic every every decade or so to to the very fact that we that we we had just started to recover from the previous economic recession. Each crisis will build up and it's going to make it worse and worse uh, the condition the living conditions of people. And so we need to always. Uh, sort of develop this uh, this collective consciousness, and it can only be done through this sort of rounded education, an education that 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 allows everyone access to it, and not only those that can uh, that can afford to uh, to pay for it. It's this is uh, as I uh, as I see it, uh, what hope is, and through planned and consistent action from all of our, uh, from all of us and through communication to, to the rest of the people, to the masses as uh, uh, the, the previous uh, speaker said, we can bring this hope uh, and make it a reality, molded into something that's sustainable, into something that we can, that's tangible, you know, it's it's up to us, and uh, you know, just being here and uh, hearing uh, all these experiences of the pandemic, it's shown me that uh, that we can do it, and we are on our way of doing it, and we should do it. So, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> this was thank you very much. Thank you, Aris. So. Actually, we have finished with our uh, intervention in this round table. I just want to say that, but f first of all, I would like to thank all the comrades for their uh, intervention in uh, our seminar, because we have uh, really touched on many points concerning the impact of the pandemic on the younger generations. And the topic is substantially the future, the future of our planet, the future of work, the future of our lives. And we try to talk about it in all the, these aspects, uh, those of activism, social rights and wages, solidarity, the right to vaccination treatments, the living condition of young people in the last year and a half. And Probably, probably, as younger generation, we will uh, carry on the, the science of this uh, pandemic with us, uh, maybe the youngsters. And we must not forget that many young people have suffered from restrictions and uh, for the su sudden changes in the way they, li they live, they work, they study. And however, for many young people, the possibility of being part of organizations, associations, and making activism also constituted uh, a way out of the forced isolation imposed by the, the COVID-19. The title of this seminar is Hopes for a Post-Pandemic World. And I think we have tried to connect together real struggles, experiences, and need that we express as uh, young people. Um, however, as members of um, youth organization linked to political parties, we clearly need to understand how to act on society, how to be hegemonic, 
how to deal with social events and discussions within our own organizations. And also, I have to be honest, the, the low presence of women in this first seminar indicates a problem that can no longer be postponed within our organizations and which also reflect the way we relate to the society. So I also uh, tie myself to the initial question that Marga asked about the, the role of our organization that must have and the need to renew the, the structures of our organization. I think that the, the pandemic has taught us a lot about the needs and requirements of people. And it is our fundamental task to seek all the ways to intercept these needs and provide an answer that contains a radical and uh, class point of view. So I would like also to ask uh, Marga if she wants to say something in the closing of this seminar before uh, giving the space to the to the questions. No, particularly. Thank you very much for listening, all of you. I take a lot of notes and uh, some ideas we must to develop later. Just only insisting in, in the same question, as you said. No, uh, but I think the best way of uh, creating alliances, as uh, the excellent speech of Marco Marone said, is also also on concrete issues. Like Harry said to us in Greece, the labor law is criminal what they approve uh, in the parliament. I mean, absolutely criminal. How in European soil, we don't have a labor protection. So, I mean, creating solidarity with the grid workers. So at the same time with the riders, or let's focus on housing, which is where capitalists accumulate the most, particularly in our countries with our national burgesses. It's not an international issue. I mean, mostly, well, in Spain, for instance, there is opportunistic funds uh, that are the owners of the of the of the houses, you know, Blackstones or all these things. So these changes in our society is something that you, you are going to suffer. I mean, the future, particularly at young people. So I encourage you to work with Transfer Network. We are open to all of you. We need to also to. We would love to have articles for you to have debate with you on the European le left youth uh, in order to put this issues also on the table and in the political agenda of the left political parties. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marga. And we have just two questions from, um, from who is uh, attending this, uh, this meeting. The first one is related to the, to the intervention of uh, Marco Marrone, I guess. I'm trying to find the first question. Okay, and is I would like to know if the creation of a public meal deliver, delivery platform, would it not be the solution to allow delivery people to have more rights as civil servants? Um, I just want to uh, address this question to all of you if you want to answer and also uh, sorry, Marga, asks if Transform has also a contribution about this, uh, about this issue. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, and no. I mean, we, we, we analyze the labor market in particular countries. So the last we have in Italy, for instance, with women or different. Yes, of course, it appears the question of the of the political platform. So my answer to the friend who asked this floor is not only a public ownership. It's a question of property, you know, the ownership of uh, this data. But why not a cooperative of workers in this? Uh, platform is something we must to also to encourage to happen because it's not only a question of the property but also encourage the workers to be the owners of these platforms. Uh, just me, let me say to you that in Spain, I'm a Spaniard, we have a progressive government, a coalition where United Left I mean, and also Podemos are part of the government. So we approve a labor law for the riders which I think it could be useful for, for the rest of Europe because we fight a lot in order to recognize their right as proper workers and not like self, you know, uh, contract workers. So maybe we can also talk about this labor law because it could be in contrast with the Greeks law, something that we can do as leftists. Yeah, well, uh, also in Italy, they tried to have a contract law, but it was supported just from a far right trade union 
and this was a contract law totally in favor of the the owners of the <laughs> platform so it was totally rejected by the the workers and this is one of the reason why also marco was um, stressing the the fight of the riders in italy the second question i think it's uh, addressed uh, addressed mainly to the intervention of leo and it regards the um, uh, the question say that should we gradually switch to the 100% organic so as not to exhaust our agricultural land by excessive exploitation of it? Leo? Oui, uh, je pense que la question du bio, c'est une question extrêmement importante aujourd'hui qu'il y a vraiment un enjeu euh, à convertir, euh, à convertir euh, une partie de l'exploitation agricole à, à l'agriculture bio. Et c'est un défi civilisationnel que des politiques doivent, doivent encourager, euh, je pense, à un niveau européen. Il y a aujourd'hui l'existence de labels bio au niveau européen. Et je pense que l'Union européenne a son rôle à jouer là-dedans. Mais au-delà du bio, ce qu'il faut surtout développer, je pense, ce sont les, les circuits courts Et, euh, et encourager le développement de, de circuits courts. Euh, et tout ça, ça peut prendre la forme... Euh, C'est des, des initiatives qui se montent au niveau local, dans les euh, coopératives, dans les, euh, dans les coopératives agricoles. Et euh, ce qu'on a fait, par exemple, à Lyon, chez nous, c'est que avec les, les militants communistes, c'est qu'on a organisé euh, ce qu'on appelle des SCOP. Je ne sais pas comment c'est traduit en anglais, mais ce sont voilà, des des réseaux locaux qui organisent la distribution de colis alimentaires toutes les semaines euh, en lien avec des euh, petits producteurs locaux. Donc, je pense que au delà du bio, il y a aussi ces formes d'initiatives-là à encourager. OK, thanks, Leo. And we have another one question in the comments. Mm. We need just the translation for this question. Je peux la lire, si tu veux. OK. Euh, donc, cette pandémie euh, nous montre l'importance pour tous les partis de gauche de coopérer. Comment se fait-il qu'il fait qu y ait si peu d'action en commun? J'espère que la traduction en anglais et espagnol, ça, ça a marché. Merci. OK. I think that this is a huge question, huge and important questions but also urgent, really urgent question, because I think it's the, the real topic that also um, involved us in these hard times of pandemics, because of course we were all isolated in our countries, but of course we were uh, forced to face an international problem that regarded uh, everyone in different conditions and different situations. So of course we we had the socials in order to uh, be present in meetings and discussions and talk or seminar like this, of course, but the real need was international solidarity. And we experienced it really well in this year and a half, but of course we need always to improve the international solidarity due to the weakness of the left in several European countries and also to the uh, comparing to the need that we have to offer uh, answer to all the social problems and issue we, we face every day in our countries. I ask also to the other speakers if they want to add something uh, in order to answer to this question. Uh, yeah, can I? Uh, yeah. Sorry. yeah, Aris. I think uh, not. It's not only what you said. You know, the the solidarity, the, the the this this form of formal communication. I think it's much more. Uh, the real bond is created in you know uh, in an, in a more informal setting. So I think that that you know if if the pandemic wouldn't, of course, be here, we'd we'd need to just get to know each other because this uh, you know the the seminars really help us connect but to truly connect with someone and have this you know sort of exchange uh, it just it needs to be something that's more repetitive and i think 
uh, you know, building this uh, this more informal social web will allow eventually for for better communication on a on a formal level with events such as these as well. I think this is another key part. Uh, that's but that just that's me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely agree. Thanks, Saris. Uh, someone else wants to add something? No. Okay, we are done. And. Liam, maybe? No? No, okay, fine. Uh, so uh, I don't have other uh, question to read for you. So I guess we, we are done. Uh, this is the end of the first seminar for today. I would remind you that uh, we will take place another seminar this afternoon at um, uh, 4 p.m. And the title of the next seminar is Embargo and Sanctions, Attacks to People's Sovereignty, uh, with the introduction and moderation of Maite Mola, first Vice President of the European Left, and also Carolis Perez, Minister of Women and Gender Equality from Venezuela, and Enrique uh, Ubieta, the Director of Cuba Socialista from Cuba. Uh, so that's it for our first seminar and I would really thank once again all our speakers and uh, I would wish you a, a nice day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Gracias. Adios. Bye. Et merci aux interprètes. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Merci. Au revoir.